Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Show. And man, have I got a co-pilot for you today. Keith Byers, you've been on here a few times before. I'm not sure you've ever been the co-pilot, but welcome once again to the Tim May Show. Well, good to be here, Tim. Always a pleasure to have a chance to spend some time and talk sports with you. There you go, man. And as you as you well know, ladies and gentlemen, Keith Byers, who should have won the Heisman in 1984. Um Doug Flutie won it, but as Keith Byers has always said, Doug Flutie's just keeping it for him at his house. It is, in fact, yep. Keith Byers trophy. Keith Byers, I'd have to agree with you on that one, just because I don't want to I don't want to upset my co-pilot on this cross-country flight. Yes. <laughs> Just good, 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 good idea, Tim. Good but idea. hey, I want to get you on. Doug, I'm like, make sure you keep the dust off my trophy, Doug. Keep it clean. There keep you go, clean. man. Put a little pledge <laughs> on there. Put a little pledge yes. on there. Hey, uh, but I wanted to get you on for several reasons. One of which is Ohio State's now two games deep into its season. And uh, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a uh, an interview coming up with Jeff Nations, the sports editor of the Bowling Green newspaper. Uh, he's going to be coming on, giving us some uh, updates, some insight on Western Kentucky. For the first time ever, Ohio State is playing the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers, hosting them on Saturday at, at 4 p.m. And and Jeff's one of those grizzled veterans, man, who's been around for a while. He gives a lot of good insight on this team, on the program, uh, and and how far it's come into the basic of the national consciousness. But uh, I digress on that point, Keith. Let's get to you to begin with here. Uh, uh, you know, as you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this guy was an All-American uh, running back at Ohio State. Uh, he has the bruises still probably somewhere in his body <laughs> to attest to that. Although I've never seen a man not go down as many times as Keith Byers did in 1984, kind of set the standard. But but Keith, uh, you know, you, you vote in that National Football Foundation and I think Football Writers Association Super Poll. Uh, you're one of, what, 16 voters in that poll, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, you've got Ohio State seventh this week on your ballot. I think Ohio State is sixth overall. But uh, just give some people some understanding of where you are right now in your in your I don't know consideration of this 2023 Ohio State football team. Clearly, it has some things to work out as far as you're concerned. Oh, absolutely. You know, being a poll voter, I don't like preseason polls. Let me preface what I'm saying. So I don't like preseason polls. So they make you put out of you know an illusion of what you think was going to be the number one through 16 team in the country yeah. but they haven't even played you know otherwise if you ask me to do a preseason poll I would prefer to rank my teams the way they finished last year you know because now we're asking us to project what we think is going to happen but if you go by the national you know who won national championship last year that was Georgia so let's go from one through 16 that way until proven otherwise but you don't see that, you know, especially, you know, say, for example, if Ohio State had a one national championship, you're losing your starting quarterback as CJ Stroud and three offensive linemen. Surely, you know, we're going to have to drop you for that. Why not? You, you know, let the next season to start off number one. So Georgia should have started number one, even though they lost their starting quarterback, two-time national champion, you know, Stetson Bennett. You yeah. know, they, they lost some – they're the backup tight end. They lost some defensive players, some linemen. Yet they're still number one in some people's polls. So since we're not doing it that way now, and I don't think my poll is going to be close to accurate until we get to week six. You have played half the season. Now I got a better idea of who you are. So after the first two to three or four weeks of the season, you know, you're going to see a last, lot of changes in my poll. You know, can teams can go from, I mean, before the preseason, I had Colorado nowhere near the top 16. Yeah. You know, they yeah. were probably 120, 115, 110, you know, in the rankings if I would have went that far. But they have a big win against TCU. Well, TCU played in the, in the, semi, in the, in the championship game. Well, they lost so-and-so, but they played the number two team in the country, Yeah, you know, from last year, you know, and they beat them, so I had to rank them 16. And going to, you know, 20-point win against Indiana, Okay, it should be better. Then you look around. I dropped them to four, and then they're still in the you know the college football playoffs where they happen. You know today they'd be top four. Well, then they played Youngstown State, and I talked to Von Brodnax before the game, and I said, Von, I'm expecting no less than 45 points out of the offense, and 
They should shut them out, but I'll settle for three or a fluke touchdown. Yeah. And then Vaughn told me I was being nice. He expected at least 50 points. I mean, 55 yeah. points. Yeah. I said, I'll meet you in the middle. Let's say, uh, give me 50 points today. Because yeah. I always look at Ohio State's schedule, say for about two a games a season, maybe three. It's not how they play. It's how we play. And that, Youngstown State was one of those opponents. It's how we play. So the first half, we scored 28 points, but you only scored seven in the second half. That shouldn't be the number four team in the country against a team like Youngstown State. And I'm not taking anything away from Youngstown State. They're a good program. Awesome. But they don't have the personnel from top to bottom that we have at Ohio State. Yeah. And with that being said, I had to drop in three places. And then, you know, Texas made a big jump on my pole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they got all the yeah. way to third. They beat the, you know, the number three team in the country at the time who I had was Alabama. So I slid Alabama down to nine. And so I had to, you know, Penn State, they did what they were supposed to do against Delaware. You know, they scored 60 points. Yeah. Ohio State, why didn't you score 60 points? Or oh, 50. You know, so. Yeah, I'm with you. And we, we are not where we should be right today. Okay. And that's not the end of the world because you want to be playing your best football late October, early November, and then you start sprinting to the finish to the end of November into the bowl season. We're far from our best football, I hope. Yeah. I really hope we better be. Yeah. You know, have we made improvement from week one to week two? Absolutely. Yes, we have. Are we going to make improvement from week two to three? We better. We better. I mean, we, Denzel uh, Burke uh, had an interception uh, Saturday. He high pointed. That's our first interception by a cornerback in two years. Yeah. We didn't have any re- interceptions last year by a cornerback. And now we're in the second game of the season. We got it. We got it. We got an interception. Defense playing good football, but they've only had two, one turnover. Only one turnover in two games. And Some you. teams are already at six and seven or eight. You know, yeah. but Rome wasn't built in a day. There you go. This is not where we uh, – hopefully what, we, what I've seen so far is not the best for the Buckeyes. And it shouldn't be. It better not be. It better not be. It, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. look at two years ago when C.J. Stroud was making his second start. Was it the second start when we lost to yeah. Oregon? To Oregon, yeah. Was that the best C.J. Stroud was going to be? Uh, no, he got better after taking the next week off, get healthy, and he never looked back. Yeah. Who was our quarterback? I don't know after two weeks. Saturday was the most I saw out of Devin Brown. And I saw, now this is my third game, watching uh, Kyle McCord. I don't think either one of them are running away with it. So I understand why Coach Day had a tough time all spring, all summer, into fall camp, not naming a quarterback. But at some point, we got to you know stick with one. And, and that the other, you're, you're, you're the relief pitcher. Yeah. You know, stay ready. Yeah. You are you still prepare the same way. And this is big time business now. It, it's it's big business. You know, you're one step from the biggest business in the pros. And so you can't worry about people's feelings. I got you. It's, you know, I understand yeah. you worry about the transfer portal and all that, but you got to do justice for the team, for Buckeye Nation, and more importantly for yourself as the head coach. You yeah. have to make the tough decision. That's why you get paid the big bucks. You're there every day of practice. You're doing an evaluation. At some point, you try, you take practice and the game, and some, there's got to be some kind of separation between the two. Yeah. You got to make that hard decision. Right. And yeah, truth, you got to live with it. Yeah, truth in advertising. But you don't die with it. Yeah. <laughs> truth in advertising, we're recording this on Monday night. You know, uh, we've got Ryan Day's press conference, uh, weekly press conference coming up on Tuesday at noon whether he, in fact, steps up and says, okay, Cal McCord is the starter, you know, and all that that means. Uh, Devin Brown's the backup. I guess, you know, will remain to be seen. But, hey, Keith Byers, you just brought it up. So who is your starter then? Is it Cal McCord right now as we record this? Based on what I've seen in a short body of work. Right. I mean, you know, yes. But I don't know. I'm not a practice every right right i don't know where devin brown and that was just a time ever at ohio state this saturday so is that fair to him you know but who said it's always going to be fair 
Yeah. You know, this is yeah. nobody. This is business. Uh, everything's not who, who always fair. When I say fair, to make the best of what you have, right? Is that told David Brown after the game? I didn't like the fact yeah. that. Yeah, as I told Devin Brown after the game on Saturday, at least now he's got he at least Devin Brown, as I told him after the game on Saturday, at least now he has some video of himself playing quarterback that he could study, uh, whatever, you know, and uh and and that's that's important for a player, you know, to see how he does. Hey, I wanted to ask you this before we go to a, a quick a little commercial I have to do. Uh um uh, so going back to your 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 uh method of approaching the poll, let's say you were starting right now with your poll votes, your first poll vote of the year and the first two games of the year, how do you not have Florida state or Texas as your one and two? How do you not have them as your one or two? You understand what I'm saying? The two most impressive wins, Ooh. Florida state opening with that, you know, just blew out LSU in the second half and Texas goes into Alabama and delivers the goods, you know, with Quinn Ewers and company wins, wins in double digits in Bryant Denny Stadium, are they the two best teams in the country right now, as far as you're concerned? Yeah. You see, but that's the tricky part of that question. That's an excellent question. No question about no question about that. It's a great question. <laughs> but I don't know how good because when you do preseason polls, you're based on reputation. Right. I don't know how good LSU is. Yeah. I don't know how good Alabama is. Yeah. You know, we're basing it that win that Texas had based off Alabama's reputation. You're They're right. not the defending SEC champion. Right. I believe they lost three games last year. They didn't even play for the SEC championship. They LSU didn't even play for the SEC championship. Yeah. So we're basing on past. Yeah. I mean, I watched Michigan, and what I saw, uh, I think Brett Corn had a two-yard touchdown run. I saw Michigan's offensive line end up in the end zone. They just mowed UNLV. You know, that's being physical. All of them blocked their guy into the end zone. It was a cakewalk in the end zone. I'm like, ooh, that's domination. That's how you fire off the line of scrimmage. That's yeah. what I'm used to seeing at Ohio State that I'm not seeing yet. Yeah. You know, we're not dominant. We're not physical yet. You know, so the reason why Ohio State is ranked where they are at this point is off of reputation as well. Yes. And that's why I need six weeks as I continue to watch these teams to find out who you truly are and who you're going to be or which way you trending. Are you trending up or are you trending down? I'll find that out by the time we get to the middle of October. Yeah. So today, yes, that Texas win over Alabama looks extremely well. But let's see how the season progresses. Then you look back, well, how big was that win? Yeah. Because thinking of the SEC teams, they get so much overrated. They overrank them. Usually in the top 25, you'll find eight SEC teams before they won snap. I mean, I think this, even this year, Texas A&M was ranked in the preseason. Texas A&M has never even been to the SEC championship game. Exactly. Yet they constantly overrate them. So when you beat Texas A&M in September, you know, oh, they beat an eight-rate team, a 10-rate team. When you look back in November, you're like, they really weren't that good. They ended up losing four to five games every year. But everybody but keeps looking at their ranking. roster. Everybody keeps looking at their roster thinking this is a team that should be excelling. And all of a sudden you get another reality check uh, when Miami beats them. Uh, rather sound well, in my opinion, rather soundly. You get a you get a uh, reality check. That's what that's what college football is all about, is weekly reality checks, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. And so I, I mean, I, I don't really I mean, Ohio State, we don't know what the Indiana season is gonna end up being. Right. You know, if they mess around and win seven or eight games and be in a bowl game, and then you look back at week one, that Indiana team was a lot better than we gave them credit for. Correct. <laughs> yeah, they beat, the, know, so. they, beat, they beat the Indiana State Sycamores, uh, what, by what uh, six touchdowns uh, or, what, seven touchdowns oh, yes. you know, this past weekend. But that was an FCS school just like Youngstown State was. So you never – hey, let me do this little quick little little uh, tidbit Go here, uh, Keith. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you know uh, – uh, the Game Time app and GameTime.co are now sponsors uh, of of our podcast of this the, of the Tim May Show, and uh, they they're also part of the On3.com network. and And if you've been putting off tickets for this game against the West, Western Kentucky Hilltoppers, 
now's the time to get them. You can get on day, the Game Time app, and uh, if you get on a Game Time app and you make a purchase, uh, you're going to get and you use the uh, promo code Buckeyes, you're going to get twenty dollars off that first purchase. Heck, it might get you in the door almost for free on Saturday, Keith. What do you think? I mean, uh, uh, the tickets are. I'm not sure people are taking this game as as uh, heavily as they should. But uh, the bottom line, the opportunity is there using the Game Time app. And uh, and as you, I've told you many times before, uh, the guarantee of this is if you find you buy a ticket on the Game Time app or the GameTime.co and you find uh, a ticket for 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 cheaper on another site later when you're perusing that other site, the GameTime.co will refund you 110% of the difference. So uh, right. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense uh, to at least use that that game time app because uh, they're not just there for, for Ohio State football or college football games. They're there for every kind of sporting events you can think of, concerts, et cetera. So if you put off buying tickets for this Western Kentucky game, Ohio State versus Western Kentucky, get on the game time app and find your choice seat at probably a very good price. And uh, Keith, uh, you know, back when you were playing, back when there were only 89,000 seats in Ohio Stadium, tickets were even harder to come by, weren't they? Yes, they were. I mean, they were, you know, I was a valuable commodity if you had tickets to the Buckeye game. Because yeah. you know that 96,006 stadium was going to sell out immediately. Plus, we had a much better schedule, you know, a team. We didn't play any FBS teams, no match schools, nobody in Ohio. All we played was power – today, we didn't call them power five then, but today all we played was power five teams. So all our non-conference games were great, and the Big Ten games, of course, you know, were great. Yeah. You know, I mean, I remember – Stanford came when they had a quarterback by the name of John Elway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know. He was yeah. pretty we good. We played Washington straight, Washington State twice. They had Mark Rippon. <laughs> you know, yeah. we played a talented non-conference, you know, team. So the, the, the ticket to the Buckeye game, those days were worth the price of admission. But even today, with West, Western Kentucky, if you're a family of four, it's affordable now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is the, this game be affordable. If you ever never been, this is the time to go. Exactly. You know, this, this is an experience. Hey, I want you to know, get with you. you go. I want to get. Speaking of Western Kentucky, I want to get into my conversation with Jeff Nations, the uh, sports editor of the Bowling Green newspaper, Bowling Green Kentucky newspaper, to talk about Western Kentucky. But you and I are going to come back after this uh, after this inserted interview, and we're going to talk about the Ohio State offensive line, especially in the running back room, and where Ohio State you clearly need to see improvement this week if you're perusing it. And uh, I'll get into all the reasons for that. But first, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to my uh, conversation with Jeff Nations. Hey, I'd like to welcome in Jeff Nations from the Bowling Green Daily News, the BG Daily News. He covers the, the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers. He's been doing it for a while. Hey, Jeff, welcome to the Tim May Show, my man. Thanks for having me on. Hey, uh, just in a nutshell, I've been telling people uh, uh, since way back when, uh, way back in the winter and spring and the summer and uh in the last several weeks that I thought Ohio State's true test of its revamped defense was going to come this week, not next week. The first true test was going to come this week against Austin Reed and the Western Western Kentucky Hilltoppers. That passing game is uh, almost incomparable in the country. Obviously, WKU has some problems on defense, but uh, am I out of my gourd here? Am I, they, they do plan to give Ohio State a test, don't they? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think they definitely uh, – they can move the ball with anybody, I believe. Um, they, they've kind of proved it the last couple of years. This is Austin's second year starting. So, if anything, he's better. And he led the nation last year in passing and uh, got a lot of weapons out there. Um, so, yeah, they can definitely move the ball. Yeah. And they're expecting to get Malachi, Malachi Corley back. Isn't it Corley? Uh, they're expecting to get him back this this game, right? Yeah, I think so. Malachi, I think he could have played last week. He had some bruised ribs in the opener against South Florida. Um, I think they held him out just to kind of get him ready for this week. But there's a guy that, uh, you know, over a thousand yards receiving, uh, led the nation in yards after the catch. So, you know, dangerous after he gets a ball. Definitely a good player. Yeah, you know, you and I were talking before we started recording this and uh, I brought up uh, uh, Robert Reynolds, who was a starting linebacker on Ohio State's 2002 National Championship team. That's about as close as Ohio State's ever been, I think, to Bowling Green, Kentucky, in the standpoint of a connection. Uh, this will be the first game these two teams play. But uh, you know Robert Reynolds pretty well and his brother, right? Uh, t- tell me about him. 
Yeah, Robert and Patrick, um, they they have that unique uh, unique bond of, of both winning national championships the same year. Robert at Ohio State and Patrick the same year at Western Kentucky when they were 1AA or FCS. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, cool cool story. They both live in the area here now. So a couple of businessmen. Yeah, let's go. Tell me, but tell me about the business uh, Robert's in now. I mean, uh, you and I were talking about it. You might as well – I don't know if you've got some free tokens uh, to go and visit, but go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Robert uh, recently uh, bought an amusement park uh, here in Cave City, which is uh, a county over from Warren County where Bowling Green is, so right in the region. Kind of a, an amusement park that had been run down a little bit, so I think he's going to rehabilitate it, and uh, hopefully it'll be a cool thing take my daughter over there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're the sports editor of the BG Daily News, the Bowling Green Daily News, and I wanted to ask you, what what's the buzz about this first-ever meeting between Western Kentucky and Ohio State, what's the buzz around town, around the county, so to speak? Well, I think uh, I think people are obviously excited uh, that Western has an opportunity. Um, I, I think everybody realizes that everything has to go right for Western, and a few things need to go wrong for Ohio State to make this really interesting. But uh, I, I don't think everybody's expecting an entertaining game. Really? Yeah. Uh, it, that's what I wanted to ask you. Covering Western Kentucky uh, – yeah, they haven't played for a national championship in FBS, but it's one of the more entertaining teams in the country. Don't you agree from the standpoint oh, yeah. of just playing offense? Yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely innovators. Um, they kind of took it up a notch uh, a couple of years ago when they got Bailey Zappi in as quarterback. Of course, well, even before then, when Jeff Brom was a head coach here, right. um, had some explosive offenses, then a little lull, but then uh, – Tyson got here, and he he had coached under Brom at Western previously. They got Bailey Zappi in here from Houston Baptist, which is now Houston Christian. And uh, man, it had one year of him, and now we're in our second year. Austin Reed, who's a transfer from D two West Florida, where he won a national championship. And uh, man, he's tough as nails. He's fun to watch. Yeah, isn't it, isn't it funny that a, that an Austin Reed uh, was basically I don't know if overlooked is the right word, but what what word would you call it? by the big time, big time schools coming out. And yet here he is. What I think he led the nation in passing last year, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and, 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 you know, obviously the Hilltoppers have cranked it back up again, but uh, what is it that number one, or it, it's kind of surprising, right. And, but number that he was overlooked, but number two, what is it that he does well that impresses you? Well, it's, it's, he's overlooked because he only started uh, his senior year in high school. He was behind a kid that ended up going uh, D one. So he sat the bench um, got a couple of offers. I guess he started out at uh, Southern Illinois for a year. Then they had a coaching change, and he ended up transferring back home to West Florida and really took off there. As, as for what he does well, um, what I've been really impressed is with him with his, his release out of the pocket. I mean, he gets it out of there fast. Yeah. And uh, usually makes good decisions. Um, tough runner with a ball. Uh, strong arm arm talent as they say now right yeah um you know, he's just uh he, he's he's fiery too he's he's a good one yeah he lays it in there too man i mean uh you know we we we're privileged to we've pr been privileged to watch quite a few big time quarterbacks you know guys who cover ohio state but uh, like cj stroud is one of the more accurate guys you've ever seen justin fields ended up that way Dwayne haskins jr you know could have been a dark uh champion uh right on down the line you know, i can name you some guys but uh but the thing about Austin Reed that really stands out to me is he it looks like he's pretty tough too. I mean, he can take a little bit of a hit and, and keep on uh keep on throwing, right? Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. He'll he'll he's he's not he doesn't have any problem tucking the ball and running and delivering a few hits too. He's he's a tough one, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny him only starting his senior year in high school it reminds me of Ben Roethlisberger uh from Finley, Ohio. It was uh Ohio State really got in on him late because they we're hearing about what a great quarterback he was, but he really didn't become a starter until his senior year in high school uh, because the coach's son was the quarterback, you know, up until then, you know, kind of like Little League a little bit, I guess. But uh, then he goes to Miami of Ohio, which allowed him to really uh, – allowed Miami of Ohio to really exploit his talents and he ends up being one of the great quarterbacks uh, in the NFL for a lot of those many years. So you never know when somebody's going to gonna blossom, right? Yeah, Western's really been, I mean, under Tyson, they've really been kind of uh, pioneers with the portal. They were on it before basically any other program, really bringing in players. And they pull up from lower levels as much as they pull the uh, the, the, 
the major Division One teams or players down. Yeah. And I think they're even more successful identifying guys like Austin Reed and pulling them up. Um, well, you look at Malachi Corley. Now, he wasn't a transfer guy, but he had one Division One offer. That was from Western Kentucky. So they're really good at identifying players that are overlooked. Yeah, they, they, they're good at it because they have to be, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's interesting because there are a lot of football players out there if you just uh, take the time to look, I mean, that's kind of the evidence, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they're definitely, uh, they're, they're pretty spot on with their evaluations a lot of times. Hey, uh, uh, how many, how many new guys, they didn't go Deion Sanders uh, or excuse me, coach prime uh, this year, but how, how many new guys are on this roster that you can recall or you, that you can, uh, uh, that you can think of from the, from the transfer portal, even this year? I think it's in the 30s at least. Um, it's it's a lot of guys. Um, of course, they lose some too. You know, we had yeah. some some couple of uh, starting linemen from last year ended up at uh, power fives, um, but they still managed to put together an offensive line with five starters back that at least started part time. So, you know, pretty good experience there too. Yeah, is there somebody that's notable that they picked up from the portal who's gonna could play a big uh, could play a big role on Saturday? A couple of guys. Well, there's uh, Blue Smith is on the roster um, who started out at Ohio State. Um, he's certainly uh, been a reliable target for him since he showed up. Um, definitely, uh, you'll see a lot of him out there, I would think. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, you know, I asked you a while ago about covering this team and stuff, but it's been sort of the, uh, for want of another term, the stepping stone for coaches too, right? I mean, going through, moving through, I'm talking about head coaches and stuff and uh, do you think that has held this program back a little bit from like just really establishing itself from a from a big time basis? I don't think so. I think you'd rather be successful and risk losing a co or a coach after a few years than kind of sit there in mediocrity. It's just not how it used to be, where somebody's a lifer. Uh, yeah. You don't see that too often. Um, I mean, I go back to I was covering this team when Jack Harbaugh was a head coach and, and he ended up being kind of a lifer here. He retired from here, but since then it's been, you know, guys are here for a few years. They succeed, they move up, they don't succeed and they're gone. That's the way it is. What was Jack Harbaugh like to cover? Jack was a lot of fun. I, I was in college when he was uh, started out as head coach. He basically saved the program. Um, they were very close to just scrapping football altogether, but Jack was a real folksy kind of friendly guy who made you made you feel at ease yeah I remember I covered that. him I covered him when he was uh when I was covering the Mid-American Conference way back in the early 1980s and uh he was at Western Michigan I always enjoyed you know those media days sitting and talking with him it's interesting because his two sons uh you know Jim is a little bit of an oddball I think is the best way of putting it right <laughs> and then <laughs> And then John, John reminds me much more of Jack, you know, from the standpoint of his approach, uh, you know, they all have an edge to him though, but they, that is interesting because he did basically save Western Kentucky football. Does he have a plaque or a statue there anywhere? <laughs> um, the, 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 there's a big uh, reception area at the stadium that's named uh, the Jack and Jackie Harbaugh club. So yeah, it's very prominent. He's, he's definitely branded at the university. I got you. Hey, well, let me ask you, uh, uh, Jeff, I asked you a while ago, what's it like to cover this program from the standpoint of the entertainment value they bring? Just in a nutshell, this team, how would you, here's how I would put it. Wow. Once again, they've got a big time offense. They come from behind against South Florida. What was it? 17, nothing. I can't remember what it was. 17, 17, seven at one 17, point. Yeah. Yeah. But to come from behind, uh, but gave up almost 400 yards rushing that night or that day uh, in that game. Uh, then this past week, Houston Christian, which I'm not sure how many people's radar Houston Christian is on, uh, but uh, uh, by the way, what is Houston Christian all about? Explain that to me. What is it a, like? Yeah, uh, I mean, is is it kind of a is it FCS? Of, I'm trying to yeah, they're, they're, they're FCS. Like I said, they they were Houston Baptist, which is yeah. where actually Bailey Zappi came from in right. Joint Western, but they're an FCS program. Um, they're pretty good, I thought, um, for sure. Um, they, uh, I think they opened with 66 nothing win against an NAIA team, but that doesn't really tell you a lot. But they look pretty good against Western. Western's been giving up a lot of yards, but not necessarily points. So, yeah, um, I, I think you can oh, make that trade off. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, Houston Baptist. I mean, I was being facetious there a little bit. I mean, they they became now interdenominational, <laughs> Houston Christian. But uh, you know, I told uh, Tom Herman when he took the job at the University of Houston way back after Ohio State won the national championship in 2014 that, yeah, I would take that job in a heartbeat because within 100 miles of Houston, there's probably 10,000 really good football players. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I think Houston Christian has uh, has has shown that because they, they've they actually played pretty good football, as you're pointing out. But uh, uh, I guess my point, what I'm getting to there is from a defensive standpoint, is this a team, uh, a Western Kentucky team that's still trying to find itself or they're are there parts there that could come together uh, in some amazing way on Saturday when they play at Ohio State? I think they're they're probably going to do what they've been doing, um, which is take chances, try and force the issue pretty quick. They don't want to you know get into a lot of long drive situations. Last year they led the nation in takeaways; they had thirty six and touchdowns scored with six. They've already got six takeaways and two touchdowns through two games this year. This is just what they do. They're they're going to take chances. They're going to try and get that ball, force it out of there, and get the ball back to the offense. Going to give up some big plays doing that. Yeah. All right. You you know, obviously, you, you have to do research uh, before a game, just like we do. That's the reason I'm having you on my show this week. Uh, but I wanted to add, because this is the first time these two teams have ever met. But when I say Ohio State, for you, a longtime sports editor, longtime scribe, what comes to mind? Oh, I mean, just sort of the, the pinnacle of Big Ten football, right? Just tough, uh, sound kind of football, strong guys. Uh, yeah, just uh, talent all over the field. It's going to be a real test, I would think, for Western Kentucky. You know, back in the day, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, when I was growing up, Ohio State was three yards in a cloud of dust. And they've had a long time leaving that reputation in their, in their dust, so to speak. I mean, the – do you think folks appreciate Ohio State being the passing offense that it that it has morphed into over the last twenty years? I don't know which which folks are you asking about. Um, I'm not sure that SEC country believes that still. Um, which we're, you know, Kentucky's always sort of borderline SEC Big Ten area. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously Ohio State's one of the top programs in the country. I think everyone acknowledges that. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Well, last thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Jeff, uh, like I said, I was sports editor of the Lufkin News in Lufkin, Texas, way back when I was 19 years old, starting in late 1973. Uh, small town paper, smaller than Bowling Green, but uh, still like 15,000 circulation. My point is, you know, I work six six days a week and uh, probably seven most of the time and stuff. You're from a, a little bit larger paper, larger, larger city, but uh, well, what's it like being a sports editor uh, in this age where they've cut staffs left and right, et cetera, on most uh, daily newspapers and stuff, do, do you, does your work week ever end? No, never. <laughs> My day never ends. It seems like, um, you know, once uh, once we got these smartphones and, uh, you know, I, I'm from the age of pre-internet is when I started out. Yeah. That's, that's really brought it home in a big way. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. It's it's undefined when when the day ends, really. Yeah. So will you be yawning a lot as you show up for the Ohio State game on Saturday? Will you, uh, you know, what, what's what's your game plan on Saturday? Game starts at four. You just go drive up that day, aren't you? Well, I'm thinking about it. Yes. Yeah, uh, you know, normally I would be at a high school football game the Friday right. before. Um, I might give myself a break from that um, and just uh, get to bed early and get up and get on the road. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Hey, one last thing. Uh, I know I say that but that's my calling card. Uh would you? How would you define Western Kentucky football? Is it uh, underappreciated? Do you think nationally for for the for the for the show it puts on? I mean, how would I mean you're sitting there right there in, in, at the heart of it all. I mean, I I've always been intrigued by Western Kentucky ever since they kind of went giddy up, you know, when it came to playing offense and throwing the ball, throwing lights out. You know, Jeff Brom especially uh, when he was there. Uh, what what do you think the reputation is of Western Kentucky football nationally? Well, I think I think Western Kentucky football is is a program that always is seen as one that kind of punches above its weight a little bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I said, they're they're going to challenge it, and that goes even past uh, Jeff Brom, to Willie Taggart when he was here. Yeah. He really got the program turned around, and uh, Willie played here under Jack Harbaugh, as a matter of fact. Um, so, yeah, I mean they they definitely put on a show, especially with this offense. Um, they're a lot of fun to watch. If you like to see some passing. 
I think you're in for a treat for sure. All right. Hey, well, Jeff, Jeff Nations, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the press box on Saturday, man. And thanks for joining the Tim May show. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Jeff Nations joining me here on the Tim May show. Uh, uh, he's a guy running a, a medium small town newspaper, uh, the sports, the sports editor. I've been there, done that long, long, long time ago, as he and I discussed, but uh, your first ever meeting, Ohio State versus the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers. And Keith, you know, Western Kentucky's coming in here. Speaking of past past uh, uh, past performances, they led the nation in passing last year. Austin Reed led the nation in passing last year. Their quarterback, he's back. They've got some talented receivers. So uh, them coming in and throwing the ball at this Ohio State defense, it will be the best test to date on whether this Ohio State defense has got its act together against the pass. I think you agree with that, don't you? Oh, absolutely. We will be tested, you know, by that by that quarterback. And they got a wide receiver that used to be at Ohio State, yep. guy from Dayton, by the name of Christian Blue Smith. Let's see what he does. You know, Ohio State transfer. He's transferred to Cincinnati. Now he's at Western Kentucky. Looking forward to seeing him play. Yeah. I'm see, I, I, I want to see us what I haven't seen in two weeks. I haven't seen us dominate. Am I off camera? Yeah, there we that's go. okay. I haven't it, seen us dominate. The line of scrimmage on both. There we sides. go. Let's get let's get to it. Let's get to it. As a run, former running back, does it? Uh, how much is that bugging you? But go go ahead and get into it. No, it, it, it's big time. I, I mean, like I, I mentioned earlier in the earlier segment, when I saw Michigan score inside the five yard line, and they got a two yard touchdown run, and we had a five lineman mowing their guy into the you know changing the line of scrimmage, blocked him into the end zone, and Blake Corum walks in the end zone. That's Ohio State brand of football. When I was there, that's what we taught our linemen to play on. If you play at the line of scrimmage, that's a stalemate. You know, that's the, that should be a, a tie at the worst. Yeah. But we want, when we run our running game, we're supposed to win two yards at the line of scrimmage. Two and two. Earl Bruce used to talk about it all the time. You know, you don't want the defensive line to play on your side of the line of scrimmage. You want to play on their side of the line of scrimmage. So far off the ball. And the offensive linemen are simply not doing that. You know, and so they're making our running back room look, you know, pedestrian, and they're not. We are, are very talented at the running back position. Yeah. But you need to – how do you stop a running back? You never let him get started. You know, you're seeing Travion Henderson get hit in the backfield. You, you know, just mental mistakes by the, the boys up front. You know, we made Indiana uh, linebacker Casey, and I think he's an excellent yeah. linebacker. But yeah. we made him All-American. Yeah. I mean, he's just shooting gaps and, you know, hitting guys from the – you know, receiving running backs. Get the ball. Those are mental mistakes up front. That can't not happen. So I need the offensive line coach to, hey, that's not the standard. Our pass protection has been, uh, it's been adequate. It's been adequate. But too many holding calls. And we need to, you know, get back to being physical. But I always, it's a question I always ask every year. If every football team I've ever played on, and 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 it's, and, and it's just simple. Fact. And the simple fact, that question is, who are we? Mm-hmm. You talk about who you want to be during off season, where you're training. We want to be a physical team. We want to be a passing team. Whatever your goal is, you talk about it all during the off season, and you work on it. And then when the season gets here, you go out there and meet your goals and show that. And I look at Ohio State's team this year. I don't know who they are. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Who, and and even the last couple of years. When I ask that question, who I say who I want us to be and who we actually are is two different things. The last two or three years, we've been a finesse team. But we're lying to ourselves. We said we've been physical. We are not a physical team. You know. Yeah. Not the way we're talking about it. Right now, I say that, that we aren't. But after two games, the offensive line is not physical. Yeah. We're not physical. And then on the other side of the ball, briefly, we're not very physical up there. I mean, I think my defensive ends, JT Timolau and Jack Sawyer, at least two to three times a game, you ought to beat the one-on-one block so fast. You ought to get off the ball so fast and be all over that quarterback or the running back before he knows what hit him. We haven't seen that. Yeah. We haven't seen that. I mean, so let's get it. And usually, and I'm being patient also with this, you know, but when you're in year three of your career, you know, even in high school, your junior year in high school, should be twice as good as your freshman and sophomore year. Your third year in college ought to be twice as good as your freshman and sophomore year. And their third year in NFL should be twice as good as your first two years. 
that's when we started to figure out who you are. So we have a lot of five-star guys from 2021. It's time for them, five stars, four stars, or whatever star. It's time for your, your third year in a program, whether you're red shirt or not, you're in your third year. We need to see who you truly are by your third year. And the season is still young. Yeah. But and I'm not just, you know, picking on nobody. That's been time and eternity. You look at myself, my third year was better than my first two years. And my first first two years weren't shabby. Archie yeah. Griffin's third year at Ohio State was better than his first two years, and the first two years weren't shabby. Yeah. That's the standard that we are looking for. Yeah. And, you know, and, uh, across the yeah. board. Yeah. And that's not asking too much. And here's the thing uh, uh, Western Kentucky comes in basically with probably one of the worst rush rushing defenses in the country. They gave up almost 400 yards rushing to South Florida way back in the season opener, you know, two weeks ago. And, uh, so this is the time to, you know, kind of put up or shut up, you know, for this offensive line. I agree with you. And then the, the defensively, like you just pointed out, uh, this team's going to throw the ball, try to throw the ball all over the lot. Pressure from the snap, pressure almost from the get-go is imperative for this defense going against uh, Western Kentucky's offense. I agree with you 100%. So the main thing you want to see Saturday as they get ready for that next huge step, which is going to Notre Dame, in two weeks, the next th the thing you want to see is just what across the board a more physical football team. How would you describe it? I want to see us play with authority. You know, quit talking about it and be about it. Yeah. You know, when we would play, we never really played lesser opponents when I was there. But for example, when we played Minnesota, we played Indiana. We would be in the locker room saying, "They're waiting for us to bust them in the mouth. Let's not disappoint them." <laughs> Yeah. They're waiting for us to run through this. Let's not disappoint them. You know, we're playing Northwestern. We're not going to let Northwestern hang around with us. Let's bust them in the mouth and let them know there's a difference between the Ohio State University and your university. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's, and so if in this era, it ought to be even more. And that's not taking nothing away from the non power five schools, but you're Ohio State and you're playing Western Kentucky. God bless West Kentucky. You're playing Division One football, but there's different levels. And you're coming into the horseshoe, and that ought to be a story for those hilltoppers to tell their kids and grandkids someday that, man, when I played at Ohio State, man, I played in the horseshoe, it was unbelievable. Man, that was an experience of my lifetime. And then my dog, that, I'm sorry, that's my all dog right. Wanted to get some some airtime. <laughs> you're get getting him riled up. That's good. Yeah, I got a sheep who and a, a, a golden doodle. Yeah, and they were. Uh, Fired up. That was let me see, let me see the dog. My yeah, wife there you go. Too. I love it. Come from a walk. But look, yeah, but like you're but saying, they, you want them I'm to be for. telling their grandkids what an experience. But man, did Ohio State what bust us in the mouth? It was different. Right? Yes, I mean that's in the. I went against that JT Tim Allow. He's a lot faster and bigger in person than he is on television. <laughs> oh, I played against Marvin Harrison. Oh my gosh, you don't know how good that guy was. <laughs> and they'll tell that story for 10, 20, 30 years from now. And yeah. coming to Ohio Stadium, 100,000 people there, that's a lifetime memory. That's yeah. what they're supposed to be talking about. Not, hey, it was the fourth quarter in the second half. We had them on the run. No, yeah. that's not supposed to be part of your story when you talk about playing at Ohio Stadium. Yeah. That's what they should be telling 10, 15, 20 years from now. Well, hey, that's enough said from you, man. I mean, this has been great, uh, Keith, as always, catching up with you, man. And I knew you had an opinion, especially about the offensive line play being lacking thus far. And, uh, I think we're all looking forward to this, watching this third step for the now number six team in the country on Keith Byler, Keith Byers' ballot, number seven. I mean, they gotta they gotta prove some things to you, right? And uh, what yeah. better time than now? I mean, I always get accused of my friends that they saying I'm being biased. I get text messages and emails all around the country. There you go, there you go. That Ohio State bias. I'm like, I just call balls and strikes. Yeah, and I'm hard, but I'm fair. I mean, Ohio State goes out and win impressively. They could possibly move up. On my yeah, just like I've dropped them the last two weeks. Yeah. So I'm I'm being fair. I'm just calling brawls and strikes. And I want Ohio State to be in the top four by the end of the season and they're in the playoffs. They should be a playoff team. It's enough talent on that roster to be a playoff team. But you know what? We don't pick playoff teams in September. So tell everybody to relax. <laughs> we got time. We got yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, a, sprint, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, I got you, man. <laughs> 
That's Keith Byers, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Keith, thanks for joining the Tim May Show again, my man. Always a pleasure, Tim. And let's Have stay in evening. touch. Hey, and Absolutely. until next week, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you then.